Hello and welcome back. We made it to episode 2. In this video I wanted to give a quick overview of the engine before I start stripping it down for the rebuild. As you can see it's still on the crane and that's because if you look closely you'll see the engine has what's called a slanted cylinder head. More on that later but the main thing is the engine is unstable and wants to roll over. It needs to go on an engine stand as soon as possible so that I can work on it and move it about. To do this, the clutch and the flywheel need to be removed. Just in case you're wondering, this is the current position I'm having to work in right now. So again, getting it onto the stand is paramount. The clutch plate is held on by six bolts, so they need to come off first. Oops, remember, lefty loosey, righty tighty. Okay, so you've all seen bolts being undone before, so we'll speed this bit up. By the way, keep an eye on the centre of the clutch spring at the end. I thought it was pretty cool when watching back four times speed, you can actually see it relaxing. So I didn't see happen at the time. A point to note is that obviously the clutch plate is under tension. So it's a common practice to unbolt the plate in a progressive crosswise pattern or the last bolt is going to be really unhappy with you holding all that spring tension on its own. Top bolt is last, however the plate is located using dowel pins so it shouldn't fall off. There you go, one clutch, easy as that. I've never done a clutch plate replacement on a spree before, but I definitely think it's a job you could do with the transmission in place, if you can get around the gearbox input shaft. Next up is the flywheel. This is held on by six bolts which probably have thread lock on them. I don't have an impact driver so the job is going to take a little while unfortunately. As you can see, the engine wants to turn when undoing the bolts. This is actually the correct direction for the engine to run, so that's not a major issue. However, I'm balancing out the hammer blows with my left hand pushing in the opposite direction to try and limit the flywheel turning as much as possible. Lots of small impacts. Don't worry, no tools were hurt in the making of this video. You could use a flywheel locking tool here. I think there is a Lotus special part number for that. Or as I say, an impact driver. It's one of the few tools I don't actually have and probably on the list soon. Once these are loose, the ratchet can be used to speed things up, but as I guess there's a lot of thread lock on these bolts, making it a laborious task, especially in this simian working position I currently find myself in. Again, let's speed things up. With all the bolts now removed, the flywheel should come off nice and easy. Yeah, right. Maybe a gentle tap will release it. Well, it was worth a quick try. As you can see, the flywheel is pretty well stuck. Six and a half hours later. <clears throat> Gently using the flywheel, it finally comes off. I didn't really want to damage those two dowel pins here, so I just took it nice and steady. It's probably all going to be replaced anyway, but why marmalize it? Point to note here, it's crucial that the orientation of the flywheel is marked and retained as it has the crank positions engraved on it for the timing of the engine. It's possibly also balanced for that orientation as well. Luckily I have one dowel pin in the flywheel and one in the crank, so no need to worry about this too much. 
I will probably be replacing the flywheel anyway for a lightened, better balanced version during the rebuild, but we'll see. Next thing to take off is the crank oil seal casing. This is just held on by these little button head screws, nothing crazy, but it's going to be a lot harder to take off once the engine mount adapter is fitted. So I want to take it off right now. Being an oil seal, I have no idea if it's going to have a little bit of a wee wee once the case is loose. The sump is drained, but I'm sick of mopping up car juice, so I took precautions this time and got my gloves back on. I left the top bolt in as usual, but very loose, just in case the cover flew off. It's just a little habit of mine. I don't know if it's for this reason, but there is a pair of small tangs and a cutout where the starter motor goes. It was perfect to gently tap on and break the gasket seal using an aluminium punch and a few light taps. Ugh, is it going to be dirty? Is it going to be messy? Nope. Only a very small amount of oil dripped out, so we're all good. Now to fit the engine mount itself. And I really need a new background beat. These are the leg positions I settled with in the end. I had to use this position instead of this one because the adapter plate wouldn't reach, but it should be fine. Now time to fit the adapter plate. quick shuffle to make sure nothing is binding and to determine where I want it locked off. The bolts are tightened and we're finally ready to lift the engine and position it on the stand. Before I lowered the engine completely off the crane, I did a final all around check and noticed something wasn't quite right. And no, it wasn't just my wafty camera angle. As you can see, it looks like the mounting has started to pull away from the plate itself. I wasn't sure this was the case, but I wasn't going to take the risk with my engine. I contacted the supplier and they agreed to send a new plate. Two weeks later and it's still not here, I'm not happy at all, and was forced to resort to plan B and have the plate inspected and repaired by the good people where I work. So finally, here it is, Lotus's 2.2 litre, 4 cylinder, 16 valve turbocharged 910S engine, making about 265 brake horsepower. Mild by modern standards, but it's still capable of flinging the Esprit to 60 in well under 5 seconds and taking it up to 165 miles an hour, which is still pretty impressive for a 30 year old car. I have bolted a few things back on so you can see what it would have looked like before I took the engine out. The engine is in a bit of a state, but it has clocked over 100,000 miles, so we're totally going to refresh this into something special. The key to the engine's success is the charge cooler. So let's have a quick look over the engine itself. Air is drawn in by the turbo's compressor and squeezed. This makes the air more dense, but it also creates excessive heat. The charge cooler system basically is a heat exchanger designed to cool the compressed air from the turbo, massively reducing the inlet temperatures. This system alone adds about 45 horsepower, but also allows higher boost levels to be run. 
From the charge cooler, the air does a 90 degree turn where there are two secondary fuel injectors that supplement the main injectors when the engine is under high power demand. The next part is the air plenum, which functions to smooth out the airflow and pressure distribution from the narrow inlet to the throttle body as it makes a rather sudden 180 degrees change of direction. With the plenum removed, you can see the throttle bodies and aperture sizes. You can also see the difficulty in transition that the airflow needs to make from one to another. Working around the engine, you can see this is where all the belt-driven auxiliary equipment is located. Here again, you can clearly see and make out the slanted cylinder head as mentioned at the start of the video. Again, note how far off center this is on the engine stand. It's really weighted to one side. The design serves to keep the engine's mass physically lower in the car for better handling. The engine was also initially designed in the late 60s to be the basis of a V8 engine which never actually happened. As you can see, it looks like half a V8 configuration where someone forgot to put the extra four cylinders in place. These are the twin overhead camshaft housings. Looks like someone's been at the crayons here. All this will be stripped down and cleaned. It's not going to be put back red either, but the same dark gray is seen on the racing cars. The exhaust manifold is cast iron and pushes the exhaust gases out to drive the turbine side of the turbocharger. This area gets monstrously hot and it's not uncommon to see them glowing bright red. This is the reason also why the chassis sometimes rusts in this area next to the turbo. It certainly happened on this car and we'll look at that in a future episode. Attached to the exhaust manifold is the Garrett T3 Turbo, making about 9 psi as standard, but also about 12 psi when you put your foot down on the fun pedal. So that's the engine. The very next job is to strip it completely and rebuild it using modern race components and get it up to at least 300 horsepower, which is fairly easily achieved. The induction system and cylinder head will need to be flowed and ported to let it breathe a bit easier. A new, larger turbo is also a certainty. The whole job will be fully documented in further episodes, so stay tuned if this is your kind of thing. I hope this has been of interest, and as always, thanks for watching.